What makes us give in to temptation and causes us to indulge in foods that aren't good for us? Foods that provide no nutritional value and only serve to make us fat. Is it just our lack of willpower and self-discipline? Or can there be physical reasons behind this? Hello everyone, and thank you for stopping by. Welcome to my fitness vlog from Fat to Fit at 55. Credit goes to Jerry Texera for the name. I was kicking around a couple of names like My Fitness Journey, or My Fat Loss Journey, or even My Body Recomposition Journey, and I asked Jerry which one he thought I should go with. Instead of going with one of my suggestions, he came up with this. And by the way, I strongly recommend Jerry's channel for absolutely everyone who's into fitness. He has a wealth of information when it comes to resistance training, nutrition, and anything else fitness related. He specializes in teaching people how to work out without having to join a gym or use a lot of expensive gym apparatus. With just the weight of your own body and some optional equipment to provide the resistance, you can get an effective workout. So if for whatever reason you don't want to join a gym, whether it's due to the expense, the inconvenience, self-consciousness, or due to concerns about the pandemic, Jerry has you covered. Link to his channel in the description below, and as you can see, bodyweight training gets results. And if you're concerned about not being able to perform the exercises, Jerry offers a whole series of progression routines designed to help you get there. And I believe you are out of excuses. And now that I've given credit where credit is due, I can get on with the reason for this channel. First, Growing up, I never really had a problem with my weight. Here's a picture of me when I was in college. That's a 32-inch waist and a 32-inch inseam. I've never in my life had visible abs, but most people describe me as lanky. From 1990 to 1994, I served in the U.S. Army. My weight was never really an issue, and I did well on my PT test. It was around 2005 when my 32-inch waistband became a 33-inch, then a 34-inch, then a 36 inch, and then eventually a 37 inch. But I was working out every day, and looking at myself in the mirror, I told myself I still looked fit. I was lying to myself. Around three years ago, I had a serious wake up call. I was in a production of Jekyll and Hyde with Carol Wood Players, and I happened to see this publicity photo. That's me on the far left. Now, I don't usually look at publicity photos or watch videos of my performances. I had them in case anybody wants to see them, but I've never watched any of them. Remember this jacket that I wore in college? That jacket is a 42 long. The jacket that I wear in Jekyll and Hyde is a 52 long. After seeing irrefutable evidence that I had undergone a transformation and not for the better, I decided to break with custom and take a look at some of our publicity footage, which is available on YouTube. Here's some footage of me buttoning my vest. They wanted to capture us doing our hair, makeup, and doing costumes, so they took me to one side and asked me to button my vest while they filmed it. Now the cameraman is moving from backstage onto the stage area. That's me standing in the doorway. No question about it, even from behind I look overweight. With all the time I spend at the gym, I should have a taper, but I don't. I'll be coming in at the left side of the screen. As you can see, the stomach sticks out more than the chest. You can see it again in this lineup. Hold it. Move back. There is no room for doubt. I am obese. Yes, I am singing, so I should be taking deep diaphragmatic breaths. But even so, it should not be that obvious. As I mentioned earlier, this show was slightly over three years ago. And I haven't been on stage since then. I've decided that I'm finally going to lose the fat, and this channel is how I will keep myself accountable. I will be documenting my fat loss journey with these videos, and I've also learned some useful strategies and information along the way, so I'm hoping that some of it will be of help to others. So, thank you for joining me. I appreciate all the support as I undertake this mission, and I think I'll start with where I got the inspiration for this video. I had my epiphany when I was watching an Alan Roberts video. I like Alan Roberts' content. He's direct, brutally honest, and he provides some necessary pushback against the fat acceptance movement. In the video I was watching, he was responding to an Instagram photo by Tess Holliday. But before I get into that, 
I want to make clear that I'm not going to comment on Tess Holliday's recent claim that she's been diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. I'm not a professional. I don't know Tess Holliday, so not my call. And I should mention here that originally, when I started making this video, I began to address the arguments made by those who insist that Tess Holliday cannot be anorexic due to her obesity. But as I went deeper and deeper into that topic, my foray into this issue became so long that it really needed its own video. So I decided, rather than to make this video an additional 10 minutes long, to give this topic its own video. So please see my next video, Can an Obese Person Be Anorexic? for my own thoughts on this subject. But the short answer is, yes, an obese person can have anorexia. Whether Tess Holliday actually has it, I don't know. As I said, I'm not qualified to make that determination, and even if I were, Tess Holliday is not my patient. But before Tess Holliday made this announcement, Alan Roberts had a video out in which he responded to a picture that appeared on Tess Holliday's Instagram. In this picture, she says that sometimes a fat girl just needs some cake. No, the f you don't. You do not need cake. You do not need processed sugar or processed flour. You don't need it. It does not serve a nutritional purpose. Some people may say that emotionally, yes. And it's this point here that prompted me to make this video. It is my contention that there is more behind out-of-control cravings than just emotional needs. There are physical factors that drive cravings, and this video is about my struggle to understand and get a hold of these cravings. And Alan Roberts continues. However, if you are a morbidly obese person, the only time you should be taking in sweets or anything like that, you should treat that like alcohol. You should treat it like a drug that you apparently have a fucking problem with. And I agree with Alan Roberts that it should be treated like an addiction. As I said, it is my contention that there is more that drives cravings than just emotional needs. Based on my research, which I will share right now, there are real physical factors that drive cravings. So let's discuss the science of cravings. And before we start, a little bit of anatomy is necessary to clarify the meaning of our terms. The gastrointestinal tract, or GI tract, refers to the tract within the body from mouth to anus and includes all the digestive organs which I will not be going over beyond a very cursory explanation, if that. Instead, I will point out that the GI tract is controlled by a network of neurons known as the enteric nervous system, or ENS. And a fascinating aspect of the ENS is that it's capable of operating independently of the brain and spinal cord. Although it does interact with the central nervous system, it operates independently of it. In fact, Dr. Michael Gershon, Professor of Pathology and Cell Biology at Columbia University refers to the ENS as our second brain. Living in our digestive tracts, we have a variety of microorganisms, including bacteria, archaea, fungi, even viruses. And there's a lot of them. There are 10 trillion cells that make up the human body, give or take, but there are around 100 trillion cells that make up our gut biome. And there are anywhere between 400 and 1,500 different species of gut biome. Obviously, I'm not going to go over each type, but I will focus on one of them, a yeast known as Candida albicans. Candida albicans, which I will just call Candida in this video, in a healthy person, lives in the intestines where it establishes a commensal relationship with its host. Now, by commensal relationship, I mean one party in the relationship is benefited, the other party is neither benefited nor harmed. In this symbiotic relationship, Candida is the beneficiary. The human host is neither benefited nor harmed, usually. It's when Candida gets out of control that it becomes a problem for the host. Candida manifests itself in different forms, including yeast, and it feeds on sugar. Now, this is where it gets interesting. It turns out that our gut biome, including Candida, is capable of inducing cravings, and worse, they have ways of putting on the pressure if you don't satisfy those cravings. Let's look at the abstract of this study, link in the description below. It says, microbes in the gastrointestinal tract are under selective pressure to manipulate host eating behavior to increase their fitness, sometimes at the expense of host fitness. Microbes may do this through two potential strategies. One, generating cravings for foods they specialize on or foods that suppress their competitors, or two, inducing dysphoria until we eat foods that enhance their fitness. In other words, cravings are not telling you what your body needs. Cravings are your gut biome telling you what they need, 
even if it's to your detriment. And they don't just stop at cravings. They can actually induce emotional distress in you until you satisfy those cravings. Now, is anyone else hearing this and thinking that intuitive eating sounds like a really bad idea? Intuitive eating first states that no food is off limits. But how do you distinguish your intuition from your cravings for junk food, especially if your gut biome is pressuring you to capitulate by inducing distress? The demons within you demand to be fed peon, and they do not tolerate insubordination. Then the abstract continues with all the ways that your gut biome can influence your dietary choices. We review several potential mechanisms for microbial control over eating behavior, including microbial influence on reward and satiety pathways, production of toxins that alter mood, changes to receptors including taste receptors, and hijacking of the vagus nerve, the neural axis between the gut and the brain. By the way, that's just one of the functions of the vagus nerve, not a comprehensive list. The vagus nerve is also the conduit through which your heart and lungs are regulated. Now the abstract continues with a double-edged sword. Because microbiota are easily manipulatable by prebiotics, probiotics, antibiotics, fecal transplants, and dietary changes, altering our microbiota offers a tractable approach to otherwise intractable problems of obesity and unhealthy eating. So, we know that our gut biome is not fixed and immutable. It can be altered for good or ill. Consequently, so can our cravings. Now, I've known for a while that candida can generate cravings. But until I looked at this abstract and the study, I had no idea just how extensive the toolkit for gut biome was. This is one scary arsenal. But once I started learning about this, I started to look at things differently. This is Holly. She was a participant on the seventh season of TLC series, My 600 Pound Life, which depicts morbidly obese patients in excess of 600 pounds, placing themselves in the care of renowned bariatric surgeon, Dr. Yunan Nauzadadan, usually referred to as Dr. Now. Before he approves his patients for bariatric surgery, however, Dr. Now requires them to lose a considerable amount of weight. Holly revealed that she'd already had weight loss surgery once before, and for a year afterwards, she was really losing weight. Then she resumed her old eating habits and ballooned up to 658 pounds at age 33. Before being approved for bariatric surgery, Dr. Now required her to lose 50 pounds in two months. And while she did lose weight, she fell far short of Dr. Now's requirement. He gave her a second chance, and she made even less progress. When Dr. Now confronts her, she tries to play innocent, like she doesn't understand why she can't lose weight. Dr. Now quite appropriately calls her out. And it's this part of the exchange that's extremely telling. All right, so tell me what's really going on. Um, I've had some trouble with cravings still, and it's just a repeating record in my head that plays over and over and over until I give in. It, nothing is working to get past that record playing in my head. What is record playing saying? I want chocolate, I want chocolate, I want chocolate, I want chocolate. <laughs> Microbes in the gastrointestinal tract are under selective pressure to manipulate host eating behavior to increase their fitness, sometimes at the expense of host fitness. Microbes may do this through two potential strategies. One, generating cravings for foods they specialize on or foods that suppress their competitors. Or two, inducing dysphoria until we eat foods that enhance their fitness. Now obviously, I can't know what her gut biome looked like at this point in her life. And of course, I can't diagnose. But I think her own statements are persuasive, if not conclusive, evidence that her candida levels are astronomical. She didn't get to be 658 pounds because of her out-of-control cravings for broccoli. It's a shame that Dr. Now and so many other weight loss professionals don't address gut biome. Interventions to reduce candida levels could be immensely helpful. And I feel Dr. Now's response to her was unfair. So chocolate is more important to you than living, apparently. She didn't say that. If chocolate were truly more important to her than living, she wouldn't be seeing Dr. Now in the first place. What she's saying is that there's a power struggle going on, and it's not just in her head. 
Her gut biome, as we've already covered, has the ability to induce cravings and weaken her ability to resist them, even if it's to her own detriment. So when Tess Holliday says that she needs cake, I know what she means. I understand. And it's not just an emotional need. While I can't know for certain what her gut biome looks like, or even what would be considered a normal gut biome to compare it to, I'd be willing to bet that her levels of candida are extraordinarily high. No, she doesn't need cake in the sense that she'll die if she doesn't have it. But she needs it to quiet her relentless cravings, because they won't give up until she gives in. And there are some who have adopted regimens intended to reduce their candida levels, and had great success with it. Australian-born comedian, actress, and singer Rebel Wilson declared 2020 her year of health, during which she lost over 60 pounds. Prior to her transformation, she was probably best known for her role as Fat Amy in 2012's Pitch Perfect. In this article, published on December 2nd in her year of health, Rebel Wilson revealed that she had reached her goal weight a month earlier than she had planned. She also talked about those who were not supportive of her goals. The commonly used metaphor about crabs in a bucket come to mind, but that's a topic for another video. In this article, she reveals, I had a lot of candida in my gut, which makes me crave the sugar. This was undoubtedly an edited quote from an Instagram video she created for her fans on December 1st, 2020. She further explained how she went on a detox to get rid of that pesky candida. I had a lot of what's called candida in my gut, which loves the sugar, makes me crave the sugar. And I had a lot of that, so I to try to get rid of that. Because um, there's nothing worse than trying to be healthy and then feeling like starving all the time. Um, and that's what that candida, that pesky candida does. So, so I went to the, to Austria with my friend Carly and, and did a detox. And less than a week after Rebel Wilson made this video, a certain article by Gabby Landsberg began making the rounds, claiming, among other things, that detoxes are unnecessary. And in looking at this article as passionately as I can, I conclude that it is, at best, shoddy reporting. But before I get into that, Gabby Landsberg is a health, fitness, and nutrition reporter for Insider in New York City. Now, the first thing I notice about her is that she is credentialed only in investigative reporting, not health, fitness, or nutrition. Which is fine. You can certainly be knowledgeable about a topic without having sheepskins. But when it comes to authoritative pronouncements on those topics, someone who's never heard of Gabby Landsberg, like me, has no reason to regard her as any sort of expert. Which brings me to my biggest problem with this article. Landsberg has this annoying habit of evoking experts without actually telling us who they are. For instance, regarding Rebel Wilson's claim that Candida loves sugar and makes her crave sugar, Landsberg writes, According to experts, there's no evidence to suggest that yeast overgrowth can cause those types of symptoms or that a detox can help. The symptoms that Rebel Wilson is referring to are sugar cravings. While Landsberg does refer to expert sources regarding other points in her article, she does not produce a single expert that actually states that candida does not cause sugar cravings. And no evidence that candida and other gut biome can instigate cravings? Hello? I believe I produced a study in this very video that asserts that. And she evokes experts again later in this article when she discusses detox diets. And this is a straw man argument, by the way. Since Rebel Wilson said only that she was doing a detox, she never said that her detox was a diet, or that it was only a diet. There are other venues for detoxing. I myself am doing a candida cleanse, but diet is not involved at all. Yes, I'm dieting, but that's for fat loss. The candida cleanse is done strictly with supplementation, so that I can reduce my cravings, allowing me to stay on the diet. I use supplements for the candida cleanse, not a diet. But regarding detox diets, she writes, These detox diets might appear to work for other reasons. Cutting down on processed foods in general and sugar specifically can have major benefits for health and weight loss. That's not because of any special cleansing powers or a reduction of fungus, according to experts. But if you look at the bottom of the page, her expert says nothing about cleansing or a reduction of fungus, either to support or refute it. She only says that cutting out sugar is a good idea. Duh. Honestly, I could go on all day poking holes in this shoddy article. This type of weasel wording, evoking unspecified experts, isn't worthy of good housekeeping, let alone insider. 
but this video is already too long, and there is one more point I wish to make. She writes, Research has indicated that even huge amounts of sugar don't seem to affect the amount of candida present in healthy people. And for once, her source seems to support her argument. Clicking on the link took me to this study. Although I note that the study concludes that there is a limited effect, not no effect. In those with higher concentrations of oral candida, the extra refined carbs seem to elevate the levels of candida in their guts. What makes me question the relevance of this study is that I don't know how long the diet was. How long were the participants being fed increased amounts of refined carbs? And is that even long enough to allow the gut biome to shift? What about people like Tess Holliday, Rebel Wilson, Holly Hager, or myself, who have been indulging in appetite for sweets for years, even decades? It seems reasonable to assume that if you're going to go for years consuming less healthy food in favor of sugary foods, then the concentration of gut biome that feeds on healthy food is going to go down, while the candida concentration is going to go up. This study simply doesn't address how years or decades of disordered eating will affect gut biome. But my candida cleanse is simply my n equals 1 experiment. In other words, this test has only one test subject, and I'm it. So to wrap up this video, I'm going to discuss my candida cleanse. In January of this year, I noticed that I was having a serious problem. Like Rebel Wilson and Holly Hager, my craving seemed out of control. I couldn't even walk past something sweet in the grocery store without putting something in my shopping cart that I just didn't need. It felt less like a choice and more like a compulsion. So, with some research on the internet, I discovered that caprylic acid was often used in candida cleansing products. Caprylic acid, or MCT8, is one of the four medium-chain triglycerides. When you pick up a bottle of MCT oil, you're buying a mixture of the four, including caprylic acid. You can also purchase caprylic acid separately. This Japanese study, dated in 1961, and which I will link in the description below, references a previous report from 1954, showing that saturated complexes of an acid-absorbing resin and certain fatty acids, particularly caprylic acid, appeared to be successful for the treatment of severe intestinal candidiasis. This study further goes on to test caprylic acid in vitro, in vitro meaning outside the body, against other fatty acids. As you can see, caprylic acid required the lowest concentration for inhibiting growth of candida and determining sterility. And I did find that caprylic acid reduced my cravings. A few days after I started to use it, I was in the grocery store and it happened to be on February 13th, on Saturday, and I walked past a display of Valentine's Day chocolate. And for once, despite the overwhelming suggestion, I didn't leave with anything unhealthy in my shopping cart. I found that my cravings were now much easier to resist and I believe it was the caprylic acid that did it. But if anyone were to go with a liquid caprylic acid, I should warn them, regardless of how much the label tells you to take, I would start with very small doses. I would start with half to three quarters of a teaspoon, take it that way for a few days, then very gradually build up from there, and increase only in very small increments. I wasn't always careful as I was building up my tolerance for it. There were times when I took too much, and the stomach pains were so intense I was doubled over. Moreover, it had a very powerful laxative effect, though Pepto-Bismol helped with the pain for those occasions when I took too much. You should also note that many of the Candida cleansing products are pills that include caprylic acid in powdered form, and I have never had any stomach issues with those. Another supplement that's been shown to be effective against Candida is berberine. In this study, when tested in vitro, Berberine was found to significantly weaken the biofilms of candida, and this study shows that berberine had a powerful synergistic benefit when used with fluconazole, an antifungal prescription medication used for candida infections. Now, so far we've discussed how to clear out the excess candida. I'm working on reducing the gut biome that causes me to crave sugar, but what about enhancing the gut biome that I do want, so as to take over the area in my gut that candida once occupied? Yes, there are ways to do that. I'm talking specifically about probiotics and prebiotics. What's the difference? According to this article from the Mayo Clinic, probiotics are foods or supplements that contain live microorganisms intended to maintain or improve the good bacteria, normal microflora, in the body. Prebiotics are foods, typically high-fiber foods, that act as food for human microflora. 
Prebiotics are used with the intention of improving the balance of these microorganisms. So a probiotic supplement contains live microbes that we hope will make it to the gut and live there. A prebiotic supplement is the food that these microbes will need to survive. And there is one more observation I wish to make from this Mayo Clinic article. It says, the health benefits of currently available probiotics and prebiotics have not been conclusively proved. And this may seem like a cop-out, but it is for this reason that I don't feel comfortable discussing this topic. I have only recently started taking prebiotics and probiotics, and my research has led me into confusing and often contradictory statements. For instance, one of my sources points out that probiotics require refrigeration. But another source astutely points out, if they require refrigeration, then how can they be any good now, since they were sitting at a grocery store shelf without refrigeration? Take spore probiotics, don't take spore probiotics. Probiotics are no good because they can't survive the stomach acids and other claims that I haven't checked into. I need to do more research before I'm comfortable with this, so this will have to be a topic for a future video. And I promise, my future videos will be much shorter. I had to get my mission statement out with this one. And with that, I will wrap it up here. Be sure to watch for my next video on whether obese people can be anorexic. I learned some interesting things in making that video, and I'm looking forward to having you see it. Mm -hmm.